We are back, and the MLB is moving. The Padres make some moves. The Brewers make some moves. The Rangers sign some guys. Nationals get their catcher back. Let's go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Talking Baseball. I'm your host, John Boy, and my co-host, Jake, coming to you from Denver. I am in a hot apartment in New York City. Hot. Speaking of hot, Jake looking hot in his Vanderbilt hat, and the hot stove is kind of sizzling a little bit. It might not be the moves that we're all belly aching for. But we're getting some. They're feeding us scraps as we go here, Jake, which I'm actually pretty happy about when we compare it to last year. It's kind of a conversation I want to get into. But first, how are you doing, Jake? Hey, Jim. Jimmer for debt. I'm doing good, man. I'm I'm back home. Uh, got back, what was it, yesterday or late Saturday night? Was on the road for... 10, 11 days or whatever, like similar to yourself. 11 days, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, uh, so good. It was good to get home. Um, still, the reason I'm wearing my my silly Vanderbilt hat, I reached over to my normal hat pile in my makeshift, makeshift office in my living area that my girlfriend loathes, um, and none of my normal routine hats were there, so it was it was this guy or bus. So we're rolling with it. Vandy doors. Maybe we'll talk about a Vanderbilt player today. Um, and yeah, man, getting uh getting our asses waxed until winter meetings, right? Yep. Hey, speaking of hats, I went. Katie hates how many hats I have. And, oh yeah. And coverage gear. Shout out. Sent me twenty six hats. Yeah. Our, they, our buddy killed us with hats. 26 hats. So I have like a box full of hats. I can't even wear all of them. And then I brought one hat on my trip to California. One hat on the 11-day trip. I went, came home with six hats because Easton gave me two and Coach Ballgame gave me three. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how the f- I just yeah. <laughs> accumulate hats everywhere I go. And we have someone sponsoring our winter meetings trip. So I got a hat from them to wear too. You know, it's just it's a it's a hat life for me. And the Reddit, the red people on Reddit, I did an AMA. Jake, I'm getting a lot of compliments on my hair. I've never gotten compliments on my hair before. You just complimented it, so dude, your no hair hat looks life. fantastic. Did you? Uh, what did you do? Did you did you shower? Did you get it cut recently? Yeah, there's this place in Pleasanton, California called Cosmos, and that's right. You, you got would it cut in California. You would okay, good. Y- you would think it's the worst haircut ever. They have twenty seats, like twenty active seats at all times, and it's walk in, and there's not a lot of English being spoke. And it's fifteen dollars flat, and you're like, "There's no way this can be good." They give really good haircuts. She asked if she wanted my beard cut. I never had my face touched as much by a stranger. She was shaving my mustache, Jake. So she was like pulling my face like I was Robin Williams in Hook, and the little kid just yes. trying to find Peter Pan. That's what I felt like. <laughs> I was like, but yeah, hair looks good. But I'm gonna. That's a hat life. Before we get into everything. I haven't done this in a while, and I feel bad about it, and I need to. I need to shout out our patrons that are sponsoring this show. There's a lot because I'm backed up, but hang with me. We've been traveling. We've been. It's been a weird schedule for talking baseball. This is kind of back to routine. So we thank Colin Richard, Quentin Hubner, Hubner, Graham Morris, Adam Wall, Sydney Mook. What's up, Sydney? Amanda Matola, Andrew Hawkins, Big Daddy Cool. Brian Mendonca, Alyssa Lee, Doug Trapp, Brady Alwine, Jack Shore, Jesse Poster, Chris Ferry, Simon Spine, Zach McGlynn, Jeff Alonzo, Alex Olson, Coldy Miller, Haley Cotman, Nick Alton, Daniel, Martha Castro, Jeff Lucas, Zach Austin Cram, John's brother, Teddy Policki. Oh, thank you. That's a secret friend. Dylan Cook, David Freeman, The Todd Father and AJ Rod. Those are our most recent patrons that signed up in November. We appreciate you. It's $2 a month. Patreon.com slash John Boy Media. I know we've said this a lot, but this offseason, we're getting a lot of things organized and making the Patreon better for the people that support us is on my 
long list of priorities. So thank you to those people. We appreciate it very much. $2 a month to get live access. We got some people watching this live as I speak. And that's because they support us on Patreon. Oh, geez. All right. You talk for a second. I'm winded. I'm still lost in your hair, man. I, I was I was nervous because I was like, wait, did Jimmy get his hair cut before the Easton event? Because that would make sense. Mm-hmm. And then I totally forgot you had your little uh your your little place in, in Pleasantville. Yeah. Um good movie. So I'm I'm good. I'm happy I, I covered my P's and Q's. I probably gotta get a haircut this week. Um and yeah, man, just uh, I, I'm I'm ready to go. I'm excited, so, excited. So we have a bunch of signings. I think the first half of the show, we're going to talk about a bunch of the free agent signings. We'll go to a break. We'll talk about the big trade, kind of weird trade. And then we'll go to break and we'll talk about some of the odds and ends that are also happening. But Jake, in general, before we get into these signings, this offseason feels better than last offseason, correct? Like this feels normal. And actually, we'll get into this. Guys are getting overpaid. Like, Last year, no one was getting signed, and we feared no one was going to make money they deserved. I'm not getting that feeling at all with this offseason so far. Yeah, it's it's slow moving. It's still, I mean, we're getting something every couple of days, which is nice. And it, again, I think our problem might be is that we've we've jumped into this world of baseball, and like you mentioned. Um, I think our form of currency in baseball hat shows our, our growth in the industry is that last year might be an awful barometer. Yeah. <laughs> last, la- last year was like atrocious. And I think it was because, and I think collusion got thrown around and I'm not, I'm not sure if collusion is the exact right word, but I do think that there was something going on in free agency that, Either all of these guys were working with companies or all of these guys hired nerds from the same background that we heard those stories that like guys weren't getting free agent offers all off season. And then someone was on a golf course and they got like two offers on the same day and it was the exact same offer. Yeah. I, so I, I, I'm interested when we go to winter meetings, which by the way, I, I know I've mentioned that briefly a couple times, but check us out. We're going to be doing a ton of fun stuff there. Um, I I want to talk to when we corner a couple of the big guys and be like, did MLB send out a memo or or was there something said that like, hey, we got to get the ball moving on this because it, it's a totally different vibe. Are there and less it's a team, good vibe? Are there less teams tanking? Because we've really seen three teams make moves, right? The Padres just threw their hat into the we're making moves ring along with the White Sox and why am I blanking on it? I mean, the the Braves are the big Braves. outlier. Well, They've, well, now the Padres have done a trade and a move. So I'm saying like our, the Padres were still kind of tanking last year. They got Machado, but that was their one big thing. Now they need their sprinklings. The White Sox are trying to get their sprinklings. They didn't get Machado. So maybe there's more teams competing. Yeah, I, th- I think there's uh, m- maybe that's it. I- I'd have to go back to the drawing board and look at it a little bit. But I mean, you know, the Brewers are in on the trade with San Diego and uh, we're we're seeing a couple of the smaller signings. I know Stephen Voigt, our dude, um, but then Texas with with Gibson. So I, I don't know. Like, I-, I think if you took the Braves out of it, um, like even if you took the Braves out, who they've had, what, six or seven signings? I think we'd still have more action than last year at this point. Yeah, a lot more. So let's start. Let's open things up. The Padres signed Pomerantz. We went over everything about the positions that were available, and we said relief pitching was a shortage. I said Pomerantz might be the number one pick for relief pitching. We're up there. It kind of is this deal. The Padres signed Pomerantz. He was on the Padres, had a good season for them, then they traded him to the Red Sox. Then he faltered ever since until he went to the Brewers last season and made a bunch of relief out appearances at the end of the season and did really well. You got a four-year deal, Jake. Yes. And I hate coming off like he got overpaid, but this is kind of weird to give Pomerantz a four-year deal, $34 million, they're treating him like he's a proven commodity out of the pen. He's not. 
Yeah, and there's I th- I think there's a couple things in the pot here. It's the the dearth of relievers. Did I did I get it right? I still don't know. Yeah, you, um, you nailed it. No, you fucking but, crushed it. Like, I mean, there is a world where Drew Pomeranz is a better reliever than Will Smith. Um, Drew Pomeranz in his short stint relieving, twenty five appearances, twenty six innings. 45 strikeouts. I mean, the dude went nuts. Um, For four and, years? And Give I him a two-year I mean, deal. Yeah, but I, I think it comes back to the lack of relief pitching. I, I think, and something you you mentioned that I hadn't fully crunched was that he, he has been around the Padres. I mean, he threw 102 innings there uh, to the tune of a 247 ERA in 2016. It seems messed up. Um but Jimmy, I think the bigger thing is it's a timing is everything in life, man. And Drew Palm goes over to Milwaukee. They put him in the bullpen, and he just lets it rip. And he's, uh, I mean, he's clearly reaping the rewards. Yes, there's some risk there, but it also if Drew Pomeranz is this, I mean, almost two strikeout and inning reliever uh, that the Padres got. Um, the contract would actually be good for San Diego. I know we're all skeptical of that, but I mean, there there is a chance it it works out for them. There is, but they're basically paying him like Andrew Miller money or Will Smith, who had what thirty saves last year. They did it for a full season. Pomerantz hasn't been a reliever for a full season. Like so, no. to give him four year deal, I wonder what the competition was. Because to me, it seems like I was. A two-year deal. Like, what did Zach Britton get last year? What did Adovino get last year? What did Robertson get last year? What did all these relievers that got signed last year? They all got two-year deals. Uh, they got. I thought they got three. And the, I, I think the Britton one is kind of funny because it's got the – his was like a two-year with an option for four years or something like that. And they got more money. I mean, they were in double digits. Pomeran's getting eight mil per year. So I think there is a little bit of the Padres are doing uh, – the Padres are kind of taking a small market chance. Yeah, yeah. It's, Adovino it, got three for 27, so nine mil a year. Okay, so he was nine mil. I think Britain was was double digits, though. Um, Maybe, but that Zach Britton's got a much better – Right. I mean, he's he's got an impressive resume. He was coming off injury and stuff, but um, – yeah, I, I think there is a little bit of this as a, a smaller market team is taking a chance. I ended up in some of the, the Padres blogs the other day, and they're, uh, uh, from everything I could tell, it seems like after Drew Palm in the trade, which we'll talk about later, uh, they they added on some money, and it doesn't seem like they're going to add the impact guy anymore. Like, you know, there's the Syndergaard trade rumors, you know, there is Strasburg and Cole stuff. It seems like with these, they're out on it. And I mean, if you're a Padres fan, you, you obviously psyched yourself up and we're talking about how good your rotation is going to be with Strasburg. It feels like that's out of the equation for now. They still have a lot of good pieces though. I mean, Machado, Tatis, they got a lot of, players for him now they got Grisham as well and they got that center fielder that's going to come up I forget his name Ray what's his name I forget um but the rotation still yeah leaves you wanting more for sure I mean Paddock can be a stud hopefully uh your guy Richards Davies Lamette Lachesi Quantrill I don't know that's love them that seems a year away so we'll see what they do with the rotation there pick up Ryu there you go. Yeah, throw throw another guy in there, and yeah, I, I think because uh, let let me get back in the notes here. I think Drew Palm was the only. Yeah, he he was the big reliever that went. Um, the the smaller relief contract that didn't get heard of, but it's a name you know in baseball. Uh, Carl Edwards Jr. got one year point nine five. Uh, so he didn't get a million dollars, and this shows my kind of timing is everything. Carl Edwards from 2015 to 2018 threw 159 innings, 217 strikeouts. His ERA was around three, um, and he came into the season, and I'm pretty sure the Cubs were hoping that he could uh, – well, no, that was that was Kimbrel, but, you know, he was a giant part of that Cubs bullpen. He falls apart this year. He hits free agency, and he doesn't get $1 million. Drew Pomeranz – 
who was a butchered starting pitcher, essentially. He goes to the bullpen for two months, crushes it, and he gets four years, $34 million. Yeah, Everything I read Six says four. Carl Edwards had that hesitation in his windup that they told him was fine all spring, then the season started, and they said you can't do it anymore. And he's got, like, the stuff, classic baseball saying, but... Um, and this is so rude, but the, the, the rumors are like the mental makeup. Like he, if, if something goes wrong, he just spirals out of control. And that's what this entire season was. It's pretty low, pretty low, low money there. But what are you going to do? Bad timing. Timing's everything. Nationals have agreed to re-sign free agent catcher Jan Gomes to a two-year, $10 million contract. And catchers are just dropping like flies off the board. We had Darno go. We had Grandal go. We had uh, Jan Gomes go. We who did Houston pick up? Guru. Garno. We we've had Darno and Garno go catching wise. I mean, Garno's not really anything to whatever. And then there was another catcher as well, Flowers. So there's Flowers all the catchers are going. But this is I, after Grandal. This is the next big one, right? Jan Gomes. Yeah, I'm I'm interested to see. I mean, he's he's a guy who's had some some big years. He's going to be 33 next year. Um I think Suzuki's back too, so they're they're going Gom Suzuki. Um he wasn't great with the Nets. Um it, you know, he well, he he had a couple bigger seasons in Cleveland, but yeah, I I don't know if it's a comfort level. I don't know if they were looking at the market. Maybe they just really like the Suzuki Gomes pairing. But good for him. And I I think this is what what's interesting about this one. I, I think this goes back to uh kind of where we started the conversation that this free agency is moving and and guys are getting signed. This is a perfect example of a contract that wouldn't have gotten done until spring training last year. Um. Like Jan Gomes getting five mil for two years. I mean, the, these were the contracts that it was like, hey, let's wait till Valentine's Day to throw it out there and see if he bites. And now, um, again, if you exclude the Braves, like a couple of these are happening, and it's it's good. It's how free agency should go. Yeah, you know who's left out here though with this signing? Chirinos. Who's left out here with this signing. Chirinos yeah, doesn't have a home. There. He doesn't have a home. He he was expected to be the second most sought after catcher and according to like a lot of experts and you calculate the average but that Darno jumps him Gomes goes home and Flowers goes home so it's kind of really hard to say like Torino's got beat out because there's a I don't know what you want to call it like a kind of a bridge there anyway but Torino's man where's he gonna go is there a market for him his 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 uh analytics he's below average at everything offensively exit velocity hard hit rate pop time um or oh, that's defensively pop time below average framing below average sprint speed below average woba slugging batting average <laughs> so his peripherals are terrible but i thought Tom, someone would like him facial hair above average yeah and i uh, i'll i'll get into the the catcher's catcher depth chart next episode but there's still a few bodies out there i mean uh, Chirinos, like you mentioned, Jason Castro, uh, had a really good year last year. Avila's a, a lefty hitting catcher. Teams normally fall in love with them. Russell Martin still around. Uh, Austin Romine, um, we, we've wondered all year doing our Yankee stuff, what kind of opportunity he'll get. And Martin Maldonado. Um, and even your guy Cervelli's a free agent, Jim. I, I don't, you know, he'll get invited somewhere. I don't know what kind of role he'll get promised. But um, yeah, there there's still some catchers out there, which it, I wonder if the catcher market slows down now and someone like Chirinos who thought he'd get a kind of a solid <laughs> end of career payday if he'll, uh, if he'll be waiting for the invite. Quentin Hubner in the chat says, I assume Maldonado goes where Cole goes. No. And that's actually an interesting thing. The old Gus from, uh, from Perfect Game with Kevin Costner. Hey, if if you're gonna if you're gonna spend thirty three million a year on the pitcher, you might as well pay the three mil for his catcher. He's yeah. let's out with right. Uh, R. A. Dickey and to- and uh, what was his name? Everybody. Oh, Tolly, Josh Tolly, Josh Tolly. Except 
Josh Tully said to Ari Dickey, like, they weren't friends. He was like, nah. Like, I was his personal catcher, but he was a dick. <laughs> yeah, it's just just the dude he threw that thing at. That's it. <laughs> Funny. Uh, what else do we have? We have the Mariners agreed to a one-year deal with Kendall Graveman, who's coming off Tommy John and made his way back to the minors this year. The Mariners give him $2 million total. It's $1.5 million for 2020 season. And if they don't want to bring him back, a 500000 buyout. So that's $2 million guaranteed. If they do want to bring him back, it's a $3.5 million club option for 2021. Kind of a nice deal for a guy who was good for the A's, got hurt, is recovering. And the Mariners, though, I mean, does this mean Carl Edwards Jr. for nine hundred k and Kendall Graben for 1.5 are like two options in their rotation? Well, I, I think Edwards, you know, they're they're hoping he's just a body in the bullpen from him. If he, and if he can find, you know, what he's done the past four seasons before this one, I mean, he could yeah. be an asset for them. Edwards isn't starting. I, I just I mean, they have some yeah. cheap options back there. Yeah, and it's uh, if you're a Mariners fan, obviously you're you know <laughs> you're not going outside and and banging the trash can and screaming through the neighborhood about these guys, but. Uh, Kendall Graveman's an interesting one. He's, he's never been the big strikeout guy. He's kind of a sinker ball pitcher, which, you know, those guys are falling more and more out of love with a lot of MLB front offices, but Jim, he's got a career four, three, eight ERA, which, okay. You know, I, I know I've got a couple people triggered just cause oh, you're going off ERA. Well, yeah, that's how many runs they allowed. And that's still important to a degree. And the thing I wanted to compare it to is Kyle Gibson. Kyle Gibson's a lifetime 4-5-2 ERA guy, and he just got three for 30. So Kendall Graveman's coming off injury. Uh, we'll see what he's got. I've heard I've heard his velos there. Read one article. I didn't even read it. I, I don't even think I clicked it. It was just the Google blurb, but I saw his. Someone said Kendall Graveman's velocity is there, uh, so I'll believe it until I see it. And yeah, I mean, what's 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 the worst case? I mean, if 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 he doesn't have it anymore after injury, you took a shot on a guy. I mean, best case, he could go out and twirl 160 innings for Seattle this year. What Seattle? Do? I never know what they're fucking doing, man. I so their rotation now is Gonzalez, Kikuchi, Sheffield, Graveman. Okay, I I think they want him battling for it. Yeah, um, done. I, is I there think fifth? next year. I think next year for Seattle is like let's let's see what these guys are. Can Justice Sheffield be a third or fourth starter, or are we gonna have to figure something out with them? Are Kalenic are are you know these young guys that they have as hitters? Who's actually gonna be like a, a piece for the Mariners going forward? And then I, I I'd like to think next year will be like an aggressive Mariners free. Agent. I feel like the Mariners refuse to take a stance. Are we rebuilding or are we contending? And they just meddle in the middle there. And it seems unfun for the fans. I I think they're re- I, I think they've stated they're rebuilding. They brought in their new team and they've they've had their analytics plan. But Who's they their new they've been team? doing it. I, I think we were giving them some love uh, previously because they weren't afraid to bring on someone like an Edwin Encarnacion and, and you know, use him for a little bit and trade him. Like, there's, I, it's kind of this funny thing that teams... Yeah, they got and, Juan Fenn from the Yanks. Great move. Hey, Juan Fenn might be twirling it. They love Juan Fenn. It's their second time snagging him. Um, <laughs> it's... Uh, I I don't know. We'll we'll see what's going on with the Mariners. They're transaction happy. We all know that. Um, Let's and, talk about yeah, this Gibson deal. Good, good luck, Kendall. The Rangers gave Gibson basically the same exact contract they gave Lance Lynn. Everyone said they pay, overpaid for Lance Lynn. Lance Lynn had a really good year. Kyle Gibson now joins Lance Lynn and Mike Miner as a guy they want to succeed with them or excel under their tutelage because Kyle Gibson's Stats aren't really impressive, but his stuff can be. But this is an overpay with hope. Um, they must really think they can do the same thing they did with the other two guys with Gibson. And I feel uh, good for Gibson, happy for him. Uh, I thought I thought the Yankees were going to be interested, which I wasn't going to be too happy for as a Yankee fan. But uh, 
Dude, another guy like nothing jumps off the charts with his stuff. He doesn't have like a great fastball. He doesn't have a great K percentage. Doesn't have. Um, he's got. Yeah, like hard, nothing's like crazy, but they think he can be an arm. Yeah, I I remember when when we saw him this year, they were saying that his slider does have like it jumped up more. Br- yeah, yeah, it, it ticked up, and you know may, maybe he's gotten into the analytics game or whatever it is. I I think what they're paying for here is a. You're right; they believe in their special sauce. They <laughs> they they ticked Mike Miner up. They ticked Lance Lynn up, um, and they believe Kyle Gibson's one of these guys. And at, we also know the Yankees have tried to make trades for Kyle Gibson at at the deadline a a, a couple times. So there's there's something in Kyle Gibson's makeup that says there's we we can trend him upwards somehow and and what keeps um, happening is this it's also very similar to lance lynn where he didn't get signed in 2018 for a while he was at that spring training camp you know with Cobb and shit so he got right. off to a really bad start finished strong uh fucking gibson got e coli last winter so he, he was like deathly sick lost a lot of weight had E. coli. So now the Rangers are probably saying like, Hey, he wasn't fully at his full strength. You should see him at full strength. Wow. This guy's he's, he's, he's awesome at full strength. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the other thing that's important, um, is that Kyle Gibson eats innings, man. And there's, there's value in that. Even if they're not the best innings, uh, over the past six seasons, he's averaged 30 starts per year. Um, he's pretty reliable to go out there. And, Jim, he's not exactly your John Boy starting pitcher stat, but he gives you a chance. Um, he's he, he he never really got fully knocked around, knocked around in games. Um, you know, he had, he had a few starts where he gave up five runs or so. But basically, he's going to give you a start, and Texas thinks with a little bit of their magic, they can make him a little more Lance Lynn. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I think the other reason you and I aren't fully stoked on this is we kind of talked ourselves into Garrett Cole, like new stadium, you know, roll it out, Texas. You're stealing him for, directly from, from the Astros. This could open up. People have been talking about Rendon or one of the big three basemen to – to Texas, and this signing makes a lot of sense for that. Yeah, I'm rooting for it to work out for them because I like when teams pay the guy a little extra because they believe in him, and I like when the guy takes that faith and comes through. That's, I mean, if you're not rooting for that, you're kind of a dick, but it seems like an overpay from the jump a little bit. 172.6 innings pitch is his average over the last six seasons which isn't 200, but you don't really get that. There's a guy at uh, the back end of the show who also has the same skill set of being dependable to eat innings that I'm interested in, but we'll get there when we get there. Are there any other transactions? Is that all, really? Um, I'm, I'm trying to see. Uh, Steven Voigt, he, he goes to Arizona. One, one year, year, three one, mil. Yep. Good for him, man. He was like being a backup, yeah. and then he he got his shot. And he was crazy. I went. I once attended a wedding with Stephen uh, Stephen Voigt. Pretty nice. Yeah. Thoughts? Uh, it was nice. He was nice. He left early. Pretty nice. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean him again. Getting three million as a as a thirty five year old catcher. <laughs> Good for him. Um, the only other thing that was of note was Josh Harrison signed a minor league contract with Philly. Um, and I don't know. I mean, seems he seems like a prototypical guy that if he has a solid camp and they need a little utility, he could make that team easily. He was with the Tigers, right? Um, I believe he was with the Tigers. I forget if they released him or if they did anything with him or if uh, they just I, let him. I mean, this might seem die. like a this might seem like a cop out excuse for. I, I'm not going to blame Josh Harrison, a career vet, for not playing well on the Tigers last year. How do you yeah, get? How he, do you get up for fucking that? Man, and he. I mean. Pittsburgh to Detroit. He was an All Star in 2017. He's been pretty brutal since. So it'd be he's he's a fun player when he's right. It would be cool if he uh, if he could get recharged by being with a real baseball team. Yeah. 
All right, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about this big old trade between the Padres and the Braves. Trade alert, trade alert, trade alert, trade alert, trade alert. The first big trade of the offseason. This is what I mean. We had, what, we were just talking about like four or five signings. Granted, some of them were small, some of them were big-ish. None of them were huge. This trade, four, four guys moving. Two teams involved. It's not huge, but it's such a nice appetizer trade for this offseason. I'm a fan of it. And if you haven't heard what happened, the Padres and Brewers have broken open the trade market. They swap a bunch of young players. So the the Brewers traded Trent Grisham and righty Zach Davies to San Diego. And the Padres are returning giving them Luis Urias and Eric Lauer in return. So I'm not to knock like Davies, um, but Trent Grisham and Luis Urias, the two position players are kind of the interesting pieces here. Trent Grisham wasn't like Trent Grisham wasn't that high of a prospect. I think he never really like dominated in the minor leagues, but he came up and he put together a really good effort for the Brewers at the end of the stretch. He started in the wild card game when Yelich got hurt. Um, and Luis Urias is kind of the opposite. He is fantastic AAA numbers. Now he's got very, very, very small plate appearance, like 300 in the, in majors, in the majors. And they're not great, but he's only 22 years old. So the way I break this down is the Brewers are receiving the highest ceiling and lowest ceiling pieces in this trade. I think Urias, am I saying that right? Yeah. I think he's the highest ceiling. And I think Eric. Urias. What is it? Urias. Urias. Urias is the highest ceiling. Eric Lauer is probably the most like. Um, And that um, that may be being rude. Maybe I'm talking about my butt. I think Trent Grisham is a good now player. And it's also needs. The the Brewers are pretty, pretty doing well with outfielders. They got Kane. They got Yelich. They got. Braun, they got Gamble, and I think they have a rookie coming up. They don't have any shortstops. They want to move on from Arcia. They're going to put Urias at shortstop, Jake, which is a big gamble. That's where I think now he grades out better as a second baseman. So now you're taking this dude, 22-year-old, high ceiling, and you're going to just plug him in as your shortstop, and he hasn't proven it with the bat yet. There's a lot of risk here. There's a lot of reward. Trent Grisham was surplus for the Brewers, so they get rid of him. Zach Davies is a starter. He's going to go be in the Padres rotation now. Uh, he's kind of like an average starter, maybe they can tap anything. But the interesting thing is Eric Lauer, he fits the Brewers' mold as a thrower. Like they are going to, they get a guy now that they can just use wherever they want, which is what they want. So those are my initial thoughts, I guess. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'll 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 stay with the pitchers for now. I I think when you when you lay everything out there on paper, uh, I mean it. Davies is better than Lauer. Um, yeah, Davies has a cup. Davies has three seasons with twenty eight plus starts, where his ERA is under four. Which I mean, that's a that's a pretty solid starting pitcher. Twenty eighteen, he was hurt. He had kind of a bad year. He's not a big strikeout dude, but I I mean he had a three five five ERA last year. Um, that's that's nothing a. Nothing to shake a shake a shoe at. What's that phrase? You you can't swing a cat in here without hitting a celebrity. Yeah, you can't swing a cat at Zach Davies without him having a, an okay year last year. And yeah, I I know the analytics crew would want to come at me. His FIP was a lot higher. His FIP was four five six. Um, so I I don't know. Maybe this was a uh, and and he makes five million dollars more. Uh, than I think Lauer will make this year. So uh, I, I think it was San Diego bringing in a better arm and willing to pay the money. It was Milwaukee, like you're saying. I, I think Lauer's a young guy who he threw his innings, and you know maybe they can find something to make him a little better than his 4-5 or five ERA or whatever it was. But I, I think pitching-wise, you you give Davies the leg up here. On baseball, so he, baseball savant, you know, they have that little, the little meter where the, the ball slides – from poor to average to great for each analytic. You know, you've never seen those graphics for players? Yeah. 
So Eric Lauer doesn't have a single bar that's above average. Fastball velocity, no, fastball spin, hard hit, exit velocity, X slugging, X batting average. You know what he's got, Jim? Miles and miles apart. He's a lefty that can throw innings, babe. Yeah. Um, that's Inning. a that's a that that's a language that always speaks in this sport. What do you got on the position um, players? Because I think those are the more interesting topics here. That's where this does get really fun. Because I know, like you said, no offense to Davies and Lauer, but you don't see those guys, you know, necessarily game two of the of the <laughs> NLDS. Uh, going out and shutting seven shutout. Prove me wrong, guys. I'm I'm more than open to that. The the Urias Grisham thing is interesting. So Grisham used to be kind of a top 100 prospect. He had a couple tough years in the minor leagues. Then he turned it on. He gets the call up when when Brawny goes down, and they throw him at the top of their lineup for this playoffs run. Which, uh, again, how how different does this playoff look? That's the other part that sucks here. Like. I, I was so excited for the Grisham redemption story in Milwaukee, and now they've traded him away. He's going to be hated in Milwaukee forever. I think they'll clap when he gets back, and they'll apologize. They're they're nice Midwestern people. Yeah, in the first inning, after the after the fourth, after a couple brouhaha's, I think they'll do it. But you're right, and you were all over it, Jim. the The big thing here is Arias playing shortstop. Um, Tatis and Machado are on the left side. Um, <laughs> for the Padres, so that was pretty well locked up. And I, I think the question mark is because he does have a really good hit tool. In the minor leagues, he's hit over 300. Um, he's he's expected to hit. He's only played 83 games. The numbers aren't good, but he's, like you mentioned, 22, very young. Um, it's going to be, can he play shortstop? And I, I think that's where the Brewers are taking a chance, and they clearly believe that. Um He's a li- he's listed at five nine. Uh, that's that's a, a little smaller than you would like to to see your shortstop, I think. But hey, I I like it for the Brewers. You're taking a chance, and I mean, what's what's the worst case that you you maybe you have to slide him over to third base or something like that? I I think I I don't know. It may, maybe this is a mental thing that I need to get over. But it feels like if you have a an infielder that can hit that's still slightly more valuable than an outfielder that can hit a little bit? I don't know. Um, I, I would be very interested to see how this <laughs> these trade discussions go down because you're right. We normally don't get kind of a... When, when we see apples for oranges trades in the MLB, normally it's like, all right, well, you're going to get you know this guy. He's 28. You're going to get him for a year and a half. Hope he does well for you. You give us a prospect, and maybe he pans out, and that's kind of the risk-reward. These are two young MLB players that are going to be <laughs> playing off the rip. Neither have a, a crewed a year of service time either. So they're like contracts is a, basically an equal swap. You don't yeah. see that a lot. It's just like need for need or belief for belief. It's belief interesting. Belief for belief. And that, that must have been the scariest part in the trade room was <laughs> – and this is this is something that you've you've wrote me into a little bit is teams don't trade the prospects they love. Um, you, it just doesn't happen. Yep. So if you're if you're San Diego and Milwaukee, I think you're both having kind of a that standoff from the office where it's like, wait, you're okay trading Arias? Well, you're okay trade you're okay trading Grisham, right? I, 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 like, I, yeah, I read somewhere that neither are like highly thought of within their own organization. <laughs> so it's just fresh start for both of them. Yeah, good. Ur- Urias crushed AAA last season, just to let you know. 315 batting average, 398, 398, 398 on base percentage in 73 games, 998 OPS. It is the Pacific Coast League. But the on, base, the on base percentage... Air doesn't really come into that. Yeah, I mean, th- throughout the minors leagues, he hit 308 with a 397 on base. Um, so it's it's can he pick it at short? And I I think that's the I don't know if it's risk reward, but that's if you're the Brewers, it's like okay, if if you throw Urias out there and he it doesn't look like he's going to be able to pick it at shortstop, 
all right, then you know what? S- slide him over to second base or third base. Like I, I, I don't think his defensive tools are bad. I, I just think, I, I mean, think about it. If they're willing to give him the shot at their shortstop job, he should be able to pick it at second base where he's played. Um, let's see, he's played the majority of his minor league innings there. Do you? But they've got Hiura there. Yeah. Do you like the Brewers' depth chart now? It's kind of good. They got Hiura at second. They're going to have Arcia or Urias at short. I think Urias. Shaw, they have him as their third baseman. Uh, they they need a – shit, they need someone – right now, this has Shaw as their third their baseman and their first baseman. And they have their backup first baseman as Ryan Braun. So I guess the Brewers need a first baseman. Yeah, I think uh, maybe they'll fully move Braun to first base. Um, I don't. That was I don't Brewers fans. So. That might have been blind speculation, but um, I, I mean, he's 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 had a few years. Um, Are there any first baseman? I, I don't know. You're Thames, Smoke. See Thames, who who came who came from the Brewers. Yeah, they're they're a little thin at the corners right now. They need Travis Shaw to figure it out, man. He had a terrible year. <laughs> um, Yes, so, cat yeah, got I don't sick. know. Oh my god! Hey, they've got the Brewers have two prospects outfielders, Joe Gray and Corey Ray. That'd be cool if Corey they Corey Ray and Joe Gray, and Corey Ray and Joe Gray. If they roam the outfield. Move Ronnie to first. I I like that a lot. Um, yeah the the first base options are Howie Kendrick, um. Edwin Encarnacion, who I think he's mostly a DH, but we saw him play some first base. Uh, Todd Frazier. Todd would be a fun guy in Milwaukee. Play a little third and first for them. That would be fun. He's my Tell best him friend. and Shaw to just fucking figure it out. <laughs> hey, fucking figure it out. I like, I, I don't, this trade, it's going to be easy to grade, I think, and I like that about it. Like in four years, I think we'll be able to definitively be like that guy. That's team one. <laughs> yeah, because it's so equal with contracts and money and shit. Just an outfielder for an infielder. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it is. Like the the arms are going to throw, and maybe we're wrong. Like maybe Davies is is a lot superior to Lauer, but yeah, I mean this is Arias versus Grisham, which we don't see that shit a lot in baseball. I like the idea of the Brewers saying like, all right, you can have Davies, but we need an arm back. And, and Padre saying, do you want a starter? Do you want a reliever? Like, no, we want neither. Thrower. Give me a guy that can do everything. And they're like, well, Lauer, but like, he's not that. We'll take him. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And if you're Lauer, I mean, look what just happened to Drew Pomeranz. You're stoked. Yeah. Right. You get to go get to be whatever you want to be. I'll do anything, coach. Just give what me a good, give me that. F- so we're happy for everyone years. in this trade. Okay, cool. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back with some odds and ends. Jake, we just clapped closing the last segment. I got to tell you, I'm going to open up this this next part of the show mad. And I might Ooh. be going out of order here. God, fuck the Orioles. Damn. And baseball. Okay. Jonathan Villar is set to make 10 point something million dollars in arbitration because he's been playing well for a team that is actively trying to lose. The Orioles have waived Villar because they don't, they don't want to pay him. Even though if they paid him, they'd still be like under $80 million on the year and he would still be a serviceable, good player for them. But they're so committed to being bad. Like they're not even done being bad yet. They've had two seasons of being fucking awful and they're still like, nope, we're still in the bad section of this rebuild. So they waive him. No one picks up Villar because no one else wants to pay him $10 million, knowing that if no one picks him up, you can then sign him. For less money. And that's just a fucked system for Villar. <laughs> it sucks. Dude yeah. Dude plays well enough that arbitration says he's worth $10 million. Every team says, nope, not paying it. What the fuck? That's got to be a slap in the face. Now, he can, if he, he cleared waivers, if a team signs him, 
he might get a two year deal, lower average money per year, um, but a little more comfort in knowing he's got a second year. But it, it's just one of those things where like, this sucks, man. This isn't like fun. Yeah, the the system seems to be a little bit off. Um and I I think you're right. I, I think there's a couple positive spots to it if you are Villar is that I mean, you're essentially you'd be hitting free agency earlier. Um and you know, you can you can leave Baltimore. Um so in in that case, you're right, and I I mean he's he's kind of he's coming off his best season as a pro, um you know he had almost an 800 OPS, um he played pretty every game for the Orioles, I uh I, I don't know there's a spin zone there that he hits free agency earlier and you know he can he can play somewhere he wants to play, uh but you're right the for what the system is supposed to be it's it's completely broken. Yeah, I mean, and and then the Orioles now they're also trying to trade Dylan Bundy. Yeah, and I like them for that. That's smart. That's good. That's good because Dylan Bundy can be useful to another team. He has two years left on his deal, and his value's probably. I mean, it's not through the roof, but this is the guy I was saying. Much like Gibson, he eats innings. He's a reliable pitcher. If you need a four or five. That maybe you you he's got the arm talent. You believe that you can make his results better. He'll eat the innings and he'll go out there every thirty starts a year. So they're trying to trade Bundy, and I actually think that's a, a smart time for the Orioles to try and trade him and get him out of there. That's nice of them because he has seen all this shit. Remember when he didn't cover home last year, and I did the breakdown on it. And people were mad at him for not covering yeah. home. Then when you actually look at the breakdown, it's like, okay, yeah, he's right. Fuck that. Uh, so get him out of there. I'm interested to see who who's going to be want Dylan Bundy. A team will want him. And Jimmy and I get a, a bad, not a bad rap, but we're uh, we're not big time prospect huggers. I like prospects, but uh, they're not guarantees at all. Um, I mean, you you're you're very firm on your stance of like, hey, if you're if you're getting some good MLB value, a prospect's a prospect. Dylan Bundy, 2013, was the number two prospect in baseball. Um, 20, and and then he kind of toiled around back and forth a little bit. As late as 2015, he was the number eight prospect in baseball. He had some arm injuries. His his stuff isn't isn't what it was. Um, you know, and there's still some numbers to like about him. And I, I think what's funny, the first article when I, I just typed Dylan Bundy's name into Google to 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 get his stats up there, uh, it was should the Minnesota Twins trade for Dylan Bundy? And that's one of those like, yeah, Kyle Gibson out, Dylan Bundy in. Now I'm rooting for that. Yeah. Uh, Dylan Bundy, I always feel bad for him because the Baltimore Orioles broadcast love to zoom really really in on the pitcher's face like just yeah so zoomed in mass and cut the shit and uh dylan bundy's gets flush with red cheeks he looks like uh our roommate in college after drinking vodka you know and yeah. uh i just it's get him away from the uh the baltimore broadcast it's bad for him don't send him to la because they do that same shit Okay, so we've ruled out Baltimore and D- L.A. for Dylan. He needs to go to a team whose broadcast doesn't like extreme close-ups. Okay. They were doing him no favors. I'll root for that. That's analytics. All right, the other odds and ends here. The Pirates hired a manager, Derek Shelton, uh, Twins bench coach. So Twins got pillaged. All of their coaches are gone yeah. now. Do I, I I retweeted the tweet about it. I'll bring it up for people that aren't aware of how many coaches the Twins lost because it's, it's pretty funny or sad or good. How would you categorize it? Yeah, I, I think it's <laughs> it's supposed to be a sign of a good t- of good things, but if you're a fan of the team, you're like shit. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. Um, their bench coach. 
they've lost their bench coach, Derek Shelton, hitting coach, James Rousen, assistant pitching coach, Jeremy Hefner, MLB or minor league hitting coordinator, Peter. F- <laughs> that, <laughs> that name can't be pronounced fatsy, but it looks like it could. So I'm going to say Peter fatsy and uh, their catching coordinator, Tanner Swanson. So good for the twins, bad for the twins. However you want to view that. Graduating Rocco a lot of guys Baldelli's, to other teams. Rocco Baldelli's manager of the year carries on. Is through, the window throughout. washers out, outside your window? No, someone uh, in the apartment above us just dropped something, which has alerted Noodle um, to protect me. Good. Um, which is odd, because I've strictly told him, like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about me ever. Like, yeah, if I if I don't make it, don't, what do you, you don't got- fret. <laughs> you got anything on this hire? I mean, I, I honestly have no thoughts because I don't know a thing about Derek Shelton. Um, wish you hey, the best. Hey, he's. Uh, I, I hope. I hope they give him a lot of leash. Um, because Pittsburgh. Who who knows what's gonna go on in Pittsburgh? We're we're rooting for some Ben Charrington big moves. Uh, yeah, good for him. And I've. Uh, I'll I'll give a, uh, an assistant coach spin zone for the Twins. Um. I, I've I've heard this spun two different ways. There's the classic way of if your team loses their assistant coaches, it becomes like kind of a cop out. Like, oh well, we had new coordinators this year. You know, it's, it was tough for the team to to put it all together. We lost, you know, three important coaches. The other spin zone I had, um, and this was from the Patriots in Alabama, which is probably just tied to their head coaches people. But they said that their assistant coaches changed so much that it's a good thing for the players because they get they get new and different coaching. So there's your twin spin zone. Cool. Uh oh, he was the this guy Shelton was the hitting coach for the Rays. And I wanted to see if he was the hitting coach for the Rays when Trevor Plouffe was there because Plouffe right. will, is we we had Plouffe on the show. It'll drop Wednesday. And he was talking about the hitting coach while he was on the Rays, but it's not this dude. He got fired in September of 2016, and Plouffe was on the Rays in 2017. So never mind. Don't even worry about Damn. it. Damn. Damn. Don't even. Uh, Shohei Atani was cleared yesterday to begin throwing off the mound per GM Billy Epler. He'll do that and then be good to go for the season, hopefully. That's kind of cool for the Angels. They still need another arm, though. Still need, yeah. They need so much. Oh my god. Yeah, man. Don't go look at the Angels' pitching depth chart. They got Pablo Sandoval as the sixth. Let him rip. Patrick Sandoval. My bad. Yeah, I think I think Haney's kind of your your classic lefty in the rotation. They're hoping Otani comes back. They're gonna sign someone. It's what quality. Um, and I feel like I'm missing someone, but they basically, they said if they sign a major free agent, they're going to be one. If they sign a major free agent and Otani's healthy, they're a starting pitcher short. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They need a pitcher. All right. Uh, the other thing is lineups, not great. What have you been doing? Angels GM, you know, dude, their depth chart right now is. Trout and a bunch of people, you don't matter. You have a cheat code in center field, and you essentially have nothing else. Yeah, Simmons is good defensively. La Stella was good for a while before he broke his leg. Yeah, man, I don't know. The Rangers are interested in Miguel Andujar. That's, I don't know if that's two Yankees, but great. Pick him up. And the Twins are bringing back their powder, powder blue uniforms. And I'm actually loving what Nike's yeah. doing with these uniforms. I don't know if it's Nike's having a say, but Padres are going back to brown. Twins are going back to baby blues every now and then. The Brewers had some cool uniforms. I didn't like the one, but I like the other two. I'm excited. It's going to be colorful for the MLB. Yeah. Bring, bring some color to baseball. Make it fun. That's the goal. You got anything else before we end this end this show? How long have we been going? Oh, we're at an hour. I, I, 
I don't think so. I think the only thing I'd throw your way, which we've we've teased ourselves about doing this. I don't know if you're ready. Do we do an elevator talk? Whoo. Yeah, let me pull up the wheel. If anyone started listening to us in the off season, this is something we do during the season. And it's we let's yeah, we gotta start implementing this again. Every episode we're gonna spin a wheel. It's gonna land on a random team. We get to respin twice because sometimes we talk about teams a lot during the show. And basically, if you're stuck in an elevator with a fan of this team, we're just giving you some fodder. Jake and I go to fodder. our we go to our websites, we browse our stuff as fast as we can, and just it, just just to be in the know about this team. Here we go. New York Yankees. Who? The New York Yankees is what it landed on. You want to do it? I'm not well versed, but. The Yankees currently have, they need another starter. They have five guys. You need seven guys going into a season. Their four and five are J.A. Happ and Jordan Montgomery. And that's not really the best. You want another guy. You want to be able to slide one of the top three down. Uh, they need a starter that's going to slide Paxton down, Severino down, Tanaka down. At least one of them. Hopefully two. Uh, hopefully three. But they need another starter that can be a one, two, or three so that everything gets slid down and Jordan Montgomery becomes a safety or Hat becomes a what will, what have you out of the pen. They They lost a lot of leadership, kind of, if Gardner doesn't return. And if Batances doesn't return and Sabathia is retiring. Retired. So there's a lot of the old guard that's been around, been in that room for eight years or so leaving. If Gardner doesn't return, but I think Gardner will. So that's interesting. The Yankees hired a new catching defensive catching coordinator. They poached the guy from Tanner Smith from the twins who just made Garver have a breakout season. So hopefully that can help Gary Sanchez stay focused defensively. They revamped their entire pitching uh, coordination from, they fired every single pitching coach in the organization besides the triple a guy and brought in entirely new guys. So that's something. Is there anything fun about the Yankees? That, that do people care? I feel like people hate the Yankees so much. They don't care about this. Uh, I, I don't know. I I think your pitching thing, if the Yankees fans are really hopeful that they sign Kohler Strasburg, I know that sounds obvious, but, um, what Jimmy was saying, and it, it made my eyes light up this off season is like pack Severino Paxton Tanaka as your one, two, three. You're like, yeah, that that's a good rotation. If you make those guys a two, three, and four with Strasburg or Cole, it makes the rotation insane to go along with a lineup that's been really solid. I, I think the big if you're if you're a Yankee hater or if you don't care too much, whatever if your team has holes, if you have holes at first base or maybe corner outfield, and we just talked about we just ripped on the A's. <laughs> we just talked about who are the Brewers gonna throw out there. The Yankees had so many injuries last year that they had a lot of guys step up and they have a lot of bodies on the roster that we think that there's going to be a trade. Um, and it, it's it's guys that we think overachieved. Like, if you're not familiar with Mike Ford, go look him up. He went nut job. Like, if, if you're a team looking for a, a sleeper, cheap first baseman, Mike Ford would be a guy to look into. Um, so the Brewers are so going to get Mike Ford. Mike Ford to the Brewers, Clint Frazier to the Angels. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess that would be my thing. If, if you're... If you're a fan of another team, go look at the Yankees, some of their stats from last year, and be like, wait, who's this Clint Frazier guy? So we pillage him, and Yankee fans will be like, oh, you can take him. Yeah, no one's looking at Clint. Uh, his values. They have two guys, Clint Frazier and Miguel Andujar, who were in trade talks after 2017, 2018, and they held on to him. And Andujar was second in Rookie of the Year voting in 2018, had a good year. Those guys... Now the Yankees probably are dying to trade him, but they hold no value. We know they're shopping Andujar really hard, and the Rangers may be interested, is what we're hearing, and that, that'd be cool. I like Andujar, but he just doesn't have a spot. And if the Yankees do successfully trade Andujar, look for them to pick up a utility infielder like, or maybe trade for like Jerks and Profar from the A's as 
like, you know, a utility bench guy. Something like that. But whatever. Scared World talking about the Yankees. Winners. feel like everyone hates when we do it. Sorry. Sorry. What did you say about World Series? Nothing. Okay. All right. That ends elevator talk. Thanks for joining with us and coming on the elevator. Jake, any final words to close out this episode? Uh, get excited. Jimmy mentioned it casually. We've got a, a midweek episode coming out with a, a f- new friend of the family, Trevor Ploof. Trevor Ploof. He joined us for like a full hour, talked about a ton of stuff, talked about the Astros, talked about his career, talked about some general baseball questions. Uh, it'll be out on Wednesday. So enjoy. Rate, review, subscribe, leave a comment, do whatever you want. Thank you very much. We are out of here. And, and everyone thank the stove for being at least somewhat hot. Jake sucks. <laughs>